Hey church, you may not realize it, but even in the midst of this quarantine, there are a million and one ways to stay connected to Westside, your local church family. Check out just a few of these ways you can stay connected. It's the Greek word zoe, and in this verse, it means to enjoy real life. Good afternoon, ladies, and thank you so much for joining me for lesson 12 on... Last week, we looked at chapters 1 and 2, and we saw that God is always at work behind the scenes, even in the midst of setbacks, even when it doesn't look like we're quote-unquote winning. Hey, Westside College, it's Christina here to give you the recap for what we went over in life groups this week. We read through Luke chapters 23, verses 26 through 56. Um, which covered Jesus's crucifixion, his death, and his burial. We are coming together in this next half hour to pray for one another and lift one another up in this way. And so you begin right now just letting us know how we can pray for you. Hey church family, my name is Jace Barber and this is my wife Leah. Hey, we've been members at Westside for about three years now and lead a young married life group. We just want to come to you all this morning and give you a few tips on how to get the most out of today's live streaming service. The first tip would be to find a distraction-free area. Whether it's your living room, your bedroom, or at the kitchen table, clear yourself from all distractions. Maybe put your phone down. Make that cup of coffee you've been wanting to. And get ready for an awesome service. Tip number two would be to grab a notebook and a pen to take some notes on today's message and follow along with Pastor David. The third tip would be to pray. Spend some time with your family asking the Lord to prepare your hearts for the worship and for the message. We hope you all enjoy today's message and have a great rest of your week.
Hey church, you may not realize it, but even in the midst of this quarantine, there are a million and one ways to stay connected to Westside, your local church family. Check out just a few of these ways you can stay connected. It's the Greek word zoe, and in this verse, it means to enjoy real life. Good afternoon, ladies, and thank you so much for joining me for lesson 12 on. Last week, we looked at chapters 1 and 2, and we saw that God is always at work behind the scenes, even in the midst of setbacks, even when it doesn't look like we're quote unquote winning. Hey, Westside College, it's Christina here to give you the recap for what we went over in life groups this week. We read through Luke chapters 23, verses 26 through 56. Um, which covered Jesus' crucifixion, his death, and his burial. We are coming together in this next half hour to pray for one another and lift one another up in this way. And so you begin right now just letting us know how we can pray for you. Hey, church family. My name is Jace Barber, and this is my wife, Leah. Hey, we've been members at Westside for about three years now and lead a young married life group. We just want to come to you all this morning and give you a few tips on how to get the most out of today's live streaming service. The first tip would be to find a distraction-free area. Whether it's your living room, your bedroom, or at the kitchen table, clear yourself from all distractions. Maybe put your phone down. Make that cup of coffee you've been wanting to. And get ready for an awesome service. Tip number two would be to grab a notebook and a pen to take some notes on today's message and follow along with Pastor David. The third tip would be to pray. Spend some time with your family asking the Lord to prepare your hearts for the worship and for the message. We hope you all enjoy today's message and have a great rest of your week.
Hey church, you may not realize it, but even in the midst of this quarantine, there are a million and one ways to stay connected to Westside, your local church family. Check out just a few of these ways you can stay connected. It's the Greek word zoe, and in this verse, it means to enjoy real life. Good afternoon, ladies, and thank you so much for joining me for lesson 12. On Last week, we looked at chapters 1 and 2, and we saw that God is always at work behind the scenes, even in the midst of setbacks, even when it doesn't look like we're quote-unquote winning. Hey Westside College, it's Christina here to give you the recap for what we went over in life groups this week. We read through Luke chapters 23 verses 26 through 56. Um, which covered Jesus's crucifixion, his death, and his burial. We are coming together in this next half hour to pray for one another and lift one another up in this way. And so you begin right now just letting us know how we can pray for you. Hey church family, my name is Jace Barber and this is my wife Leah. Hey, we've been members at Westside for about three years now and we've begun married life group. We just want to come to you all this morning and give you a few tips on how to get the most out of today's live streaming service. The first tip would be to find a distraction-free area. Whether it's your living room, your bedroom, or at the kitchen table, clear yourself from all distractions. Maybe put your phone down. Make that cup of coffee you've been wanting to. And get ready for an awesome service. Tip number two would be to grab a notebook and a pen to take some notes on today's message and follow along with Pastor David. The third tip would be to pray. Spend some time with your family asking the Lord to prepare your hearts for the worship and for the message. We hope you all enjoy today's message and have a great rest of your week. Hey, good morning, Westside, and happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers. I want to give a special shout out to my mom and Shelly, my wife. Uh, I get to do that because I'm on camera, but we're glad that you're joining with us today. Let me just say, if you're new and joining us maybe for the first time or you haven't connected with us yet, we'd love for you to do so online. You can visit our website, westsidebaptist.org slash I'm new and fill out that, that form. We'd love to be able to know how we can serve you. If you have any questions about our church, it would be, be wonderful to connect with you. And, and church, let me just tell you, we're, we're super grateful for the ways that you continue to give. We continue to ask God to give us wisdom and how we steward these resources. But this past Friday, because of your giving, we were able to partner with our friends at I Love New York Pizza, and we were able to, to feed 14 nursing units at North Florida Regional Medical Center. Uh, as a way to say thank you for serving there on the front lines. And so we just want you to know we're very appreciative of, of the ways that you send your, your tithes and your offerings in. You can do that on the, on the um, website. You can do that through our app. You also can mail those in. But we're thankful for the way that you continue to be generous givers here at Westside. Uh, hey, life groups are, are continuing here. Uh, almost all of our life groups are, are in regular season. Um, our college groups, we are, we're about to kick off our summer semester, but if you've not joined us in, in a life group and you're in any age group, we'd love for you to visit us online, westsidebaptist.org slash life groups, and you can let us know how, how we can best connect you to one of the groups that are happening. Uh, it's a great place that you can be in community and study God's Word together. We think that theology is best done in community. And so please use that as a way that you can connect even during this time where we're not able to be here together at church. Uh, and, and then also know that, that we understand there's lots of, of needs right now, lots of things that we can be praying and lifting up to God together. And so if you'd like to, to submit a prayer request and let our staff uh, here pray for you and lift those requests up, you can do that through our website, westsidebaptist.org backslash prayer. 
and we'd be able to take those and agree with you and, and just see, uh, maybe even from that, how we can help meet some needs for you. Uh, we're thankful again that you're here worshiping with us uh, at home. Uh, we'd love for you to engage and interact with us online, so you can do that uh, through Facebook or through YouTube in those comments. Let us know that you're here. Uh, maybe even send us a picture of uh, how your, your group is, is celebrating Mother's Day. Uh, hopefully you got all the kids to dress up during this time so they're not just wearing their pajamas to church. Uh, and the last thing is this. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit in the days ahead about our, our plan to come back and begin to worship together in person at, at, at our church. Uh, and so we want you to make sure that you are following us on social media, and that could be uh, on Facebook or Instagram. It's at Westside Gainesville. And, and pay attention to that because we're going to release some information about when we're planning to do that and how we're going to plan to do that in this coming week. But we're thankful for you joining us today. And we hope that you have a great time worshiping with us. Well, good morning, church family. If you would join with us as we worship this morning. This battle belongs to the Lord. We're going to sing. We're going to see a victory. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh my God, I will
morning, everybody. Welcome to Worship at Home here with Westside. And we're so grateful that you've joined us from wherever you are. I hope you uh, will sing and worship with us, that you'll pray with us, that you'll open up your Bibles and be ready to hear from God's Word out of the book of James today. It's going to be an awesome day of worship. And let me just begin by saying, Happy Mother's Day. We are so thankful and grateful for our moms Uh, We are praying for you. I know that some of you may be separated from your families today because of the, uh, the pandemic, and we're praying for you. And I know some of you as moms have had your kids come home, and you're rejoicing that you've had some extra time. And so we know this is a special day for you, and we want you to know that we love you and appreciate you. And I hope somebody really makes you feel special today on Mother's Day. And let me also welcome those of you who may be first time watching. Maybe you were driving by on Facebook or YouTube and you've dropped in to watch. We're so grateful. You can text the number that's on your screen and let us know. Just text that you're new. Uh, We'd love to converse with you. Uh, You can also go to our website and let us know that. We have a place where you can go, westsidebaptist.org slash prayer. It's a place where you can give us prayer requests. You can comment on the message or on the worship. You can let us know and and interact with us. We'd love to know that you're new with us today. And so thank you for being here. We're going to continue to worship now. And as we do, remember that worship is an act of praise, an act of adoration. It's an act of listening to God. And then it's never really finished until we respond to God's Word, until we say, yes, Lord, to His commandments and to the way He speaks to us today. And also one of the important acts of worship is giving. I encourage you to be faithful in your tithes and offerings. And I know it's a difficult time. If you're able, I pray that you will continue to give. Thank you for your faithfulness thus far. And we just know that you'll complete. God will supply our needs. But he's using your faithfulness and giving to do that. Uh, We have more online givers. You can give online. You can give through our app. You can also just mail it in. Well, God bless you. Let me pray for us as we continue to worship. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for an awesome opportunity to gather God's people online to turn our hearts towards you, to worship you, to hear from you, and to respond. God, I'm thankful for all of our mothers. I thank you for the sacrifices that they make and will make. And God, I pray that we'll make them feel very special today. We thank you for their love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
You never runs out on me Your love never fails It never gives up It never runs out on me
Lord, we lift that up this morning. We say, it is well with my soul, no matter what's in front of me, no matter what's going on around me, through it all, our eyes are fixed on you. So speak to us this morning, Lord. We're ready to hear from you, in Jesus' name. Well, welcome everybody this morning. I hope you'll take your Bibles, and if you would, turn to the book of James, chapter 4, verse 1. James, chapter 4, verse 1, as we continue this series in uh, the book of James on vital signs of whether you have a living faith or a faith that is really not in the Lord. And so it's a great test of our faith, this examination that we're having through the book of James. And I'm so glad, so excited that you've joined us again this morning. Because we, we can't see you through the lens, but we're praying that most of you, many of you of our congregation are watching, and maybe some guests today, and I hope today, will bless you as we look at the next vital sign in the book of James. Well, let me answer a couple questions, and uh, first of all, I'm getting some, uh, some questions across our congregation on when we might return to worship in our, in our facilities. Uh, things are loosening up as far as restrictions in our community. Well, we have a plan, and I sent out an email and a video this week. I hope you'll read those. Check your, your inbox for that. It has a detailed plan. Uh, we are praying and preparing to have some live worship services on either, either of the last two weeks of the month of May. And we're preparing for that. And it takes a lot of preparation because there are still restrictions that our county government is holding to that the CDC wants us to hold to if we allow people into our building. And the one that you really need to understand is that we're limited to one person for every 500 square feet. Now, you might think we got a lot of square feet. We do, 70,000 just in our main building. That means only about 120 people can gather at one time. So we're preparing to have multiple services. But we're also uh, prepare, uh, preparing with the idea that many in vulnerable populations, our older folks, and those who have any kind of uh, health uh, problems will not be coming. They'll stay at home. Uh, and also, we're going to have a reservation system. So I hope you'll read that email we're going to have to, to do that to make sure that we can limit the attendance to 120 in the main building, to 50 in the Family Life Center. But we're making preparations, hopefully for the 24th or for the 31st of May. It is still a bit of a fluid situation, but we want uh, to keep you safe and healthy. And we want to be responsible citizens in our local county. And so just pray as we prepare for that. Second of all, today is Mother's Day, and I'm so grateful for all of our moms. And speaking of homecoming, uh, I know many have come home during this uh, pandemic time, this shut-in time. But some of you have not seen your family, and I'm conscious of that. Uh, for us, though, at the Chauncey household, it's, it's been kind of fun. Uh, we've had our kids sort of stranded at the house, and so my, my wife... The mother of my children has really had some great time with her kids. And, um, but I'm mindful that, that all of this being uh, bound into our homes has increased across our land domestic violence. Not every home is a healthy or a happy home. And today's message out of the book of James is going to help us deal with conflict and the principles that James give us, gives us for dealing with conflict in the church are actually principles that can really help us deal with conflict in our homes. And what mom doesn't want a, ho a home and a house filled with peace, wants to see her children and grandchildren getting along? And um, it's kind of funny. We've been uh, using this time to transfer a lot of videos uh, getting them from the old style into digital format so that we can preserve them over the years. And, and uh, several times if I'm just listening and, and Sarah's doing some of this transferring work and I'm hearing the videos in the background, there are several times in the history of our family where I'm videotaping and the kids that I'm videotaping break out into a fight. Now, no doubt many of you have had the same thing happen. But a lot of times... I'll just leave the camera running, and I say the same thing every time. I say, listen, I'm going to keep filming so people know what you were really like. 
I'm going to keep filming so that when you show this to your kids one day, uh, I'm just going to kind of giggle when they break out in fights as well. And uh, it's kind of funny to, to see that and, um, and to think of it in that way, but it is not funny when those same kind of break, uh, fights are breaking out in a church family or in a community. Conflict breaks our hearts. Conflict also breaks the heart of the Lord. It's one thing for a group of children to have the kind of immaturity or spiritual immaturity that they fight and they push and shove and they're selfish and all of those kind of things that we deal with as we grow up. But when we claim to be mature believers in Christ, like some of the folks in the book of James are claiming to be, and yet we are marked by continual conflict and disharmony in the body of Christ, here's what James is going to say. He's going to say, you don't have a living faith. A living faith is not marked by hostility. Here's what a living faith is marked by. In this passage today, we're going to see that a living faith is marked by a spirit of humility. Not hostility, but a spirit of humility. And so if we look at this passage, we're going to see uh, that it really examines our hearts. And, you know, the book of James has been a little bit like this coronavirus test. Uh, it's uncomfortable. Uh, a few months ago, I had a strep throat, or I thought I had strep throat, and they stuck one of those things way up into my nose, and it felt like they were scratching the front of your brain. And some of you have had that test. And that's exactly what the book of, of James does. It says, take off your mask and allow the Lord to... Uh, get behind the exterior and penetrate into your heart. And there it can measure the vital signs of your faith. And so the book of James is one of the most incredible books in the Bible because it so thoroughly tests our faith. It gets right to the point. It hits deep. We just left in chapter 3 a picture that every mom would want for her household, the picture that every pastor would want for his church, the picture that every citizen would want for their own community. Let's, let's review. In chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For where jealousy and self selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Doesn't that sound like a happy home, full of happy campers, a happy community, a happy church, gentle, peaceable, reasonable, full of forgiveness, full of mercy and good fruits? We saw last week that that, that is what you look for to know that you are living on God's wisdom instead of the earthly wisdom. And it says in verse 18, the harvest, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Well, if you go right to the next verse, it is a startling contrast to that picture, that church, that marriage, that home. It is a startling contrast. And unfortunately, sometimes this really can be what our homes and our churches and our lives look like. And so James asks a question, and that's what he does through this book. As a way of examining us, he asks the question, have you thought about what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? That's chapter 4, verse 1. Have you thought about that? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. 
Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace, watch this, to the humble. And here are some marks of a humble spirit. Verse 7, submit yourselves to Therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hand, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that through this message, you'd, you'd help us to have homes with great harmony. You would fulfill the dreams of moms all over the land today who want harmony in their homes. I pray, God, that most of all, you would help us to have harmony with you, that we would humble ourselves before you. And as we're in right relationship with you, God, it will bring right relationship with others. Teach us today. Teach us today from your word. Examine us and help us see the vitality of our faith. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So how, how do I know if I have a humble spirit? That's always a tricky question, isn't it? I mean, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, listen, I've got one of the most humble spirits you've ever seen, they kind of disqualified themselves automatically. But I think in this passage, if we'll watch it, if we'll look through it, it will help us answer that question. And what James shows us is that this humility of spirit that breaks down pride and allows us to be in harmony with our brothers and sisters, that kind of humble spirit uh, is marked. There are several indicators of that. And I'm going to pull those out for you. What, what a, a, a humble spirit realizes is they're going to realize the, the cause, the real cause of hostility and conflict. They're going to have a, a recognition and a regret for the cost of their conflicts. And they're finally, they're going to run to the cure. They're going to pursue the cure of conflicts. If you look in the first verse first couple of verses, you'll see uh, very clearly what the cause of conflict really is. Our first reaction would be, well, it's obviously their problem. Well, that's not what God says. Look what he says. What causes quarrels, it's your passions within you. You desire, verse 2, and you murder. You covet and cannot obtain. You fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Verse, uh, if you notice this, uh, there are fightings and quarrels. And, and what James is probably pointing out in the context of the church are, are uh, uh, political conflicts, conflicts over who's in charge, disputes over theological arguments and controversies between teachers and factions in the church. There was also struggling... Uh, that was creating division in the church over uh, uh, worldly desires and immorality and all of those things. But if you were to boil it down to one word, uh, the word James uses is desire or passions. He uses that word twice. And the word in the Greek is where we get the word hedonism from. And hedonism in the ideas of, a, of the Greek was the, meant this is your chief purpose of your life is to satisfy yourself. Now let me pause right here and say God wants us to be satisfied. God wants us to have great passion. And so passion and desire is not the problem. It is the object. It's the sinfulness. It's the selfishness of this passion and desire that, that are, that's driving the conflicts in the church. And, and it's also what is driving the conflicts in our marriages. It's driving the conflicts uh, in, uh, in our families and in our communities. Spiritual humility 
is when you come to the point that you realize uh, that the problem, uh, the war with others is actually because of a war within, a war that is battling in you between your selfish, prideful desires. If you are an unbeliever this morning, you haven't trusted Christ, you have willpower and you have some things that can fight against it, but ultimately, those with no true faith will be dominated by their personal, selfish desires throughout their lives. And even us who have placed our faith in Christ and have a new spirit and the Holy Spirit within us are not free of the battle. It is a constant front in our lives, a war front, a battle line, where we have this alien army of inordinate fleshly desires uh, assaulting our new nature and our new desire to follow Christ. And so it's the the war between our pre-Christian nature that still seeks control. If we're not fighting that battle, if we don't understand that our passions are at the core of our conflicts, we're just continually losing that battle. And we don't have a chance of long-term harmony in our churches and in our homes. So the humble, a humble spirit is recognizing it is our own personal passions and desires when they're pridefully, selfishly, in a fleshly way, motivated, that become the source of conflict. Now listen, none of us are beyond that. But if your life is marked by continual um, domination by fleshly desires, it is a sign not of living vital faith, but of no faith at all. The humble spirit recognizes the true cause of conflict. Now James goes on, and he begins to to talk about the cost of our selfish desires, the cost of our conflict. And and a humble spirit, spiritually, uh, has the blinders removed and is able to see the true costs of hostility towards others, hostility towards others, between our hearts and God and the cost of our selfish desires. Let's look at it. The first cost we see in verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. In other words, uh, James says your prayers become useless. Your prayers are not in the right motivation and the, and the subject of your prayer, the motivation of your prayer, is to be spent on your will, your desire, your passions. Isn't it, isn't it interesting that when Jesus taught us to pray, he started right in that realm, right in that sphere? He says, he says uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's a fancy way of saying, in my life, God, I want you to get the glory. I want your name to be famous. What I'm about to ask you, God, the the desires of my heart, I want them to be uh, the things that would bring you the most glory. And then he goes on to say in in his his model prayer for us, uh, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. In other words, may everything about what I'm desiring and everything about what I'm asking and praying for, everything that I'm doing in my home with my wife and my kids, everything that I'm doing in my church and that I really desire, may all of it be wrapped up under your kingdom, your rule. I want it to be what you want, God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. May everything I want, may everything that I ask for, I pray that it's what you want, God. I pray that it's what you can't wait to give me. Someone wrote, there is to be sure no prayer that we all need to pray so much as the prayer that we may love what God commands and desire what he promises. And that's how we should start all of our prayers. A spirit of humility wants God's name to be hallowed 
God's rule in his life and God's will to be done. And we conform our desires to that. And when we find out and we discover that our desires are being driven by earthly wisdom and physical pleasure and prideful, selfish passions, we, we confess that and repent that and yield that to the Father. Because these kinds of passions and these kind of conflicts make our prayers useless. The second thing, it even makes our prayers offensive. Look what he says in verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. What a startling statement. He's talking about these earthly passions that are um, dominating our lives. And then he he says, it's like being an adulterer. He calls them adulterers. Uh, we, uh, we, We are deciding to give what is God's in friendship and love for the world rather than yielding what is God's in love and friendship with our Heavenly Father. He says that's a, that's a form of spiritual idolatry, and our passions drive us towards that. And a lot of times our conflicts, our arguments, the lack of peace we have in our life or the lack of peace we have in our church or in our home are indicators that passions are in the wrong place. Spiritual humility seeks to recognize the cause of the conflict and regrets and repents over uh, that cause and the cost of those things. Look what he says. We become enemies of God and we ask wrongly to spend it in our own passions. I was, I was imagining today's Mother's Day and I, I imagine a bunch of you may have brought to your uh, wife or your mom, you sent some flowers or maybe you made her breakfast in bed and you know when my kids were, were younger we always went through the routine where they would say, Dad, listen, can I have a credit card? I want to go buy Mom a gift. Or can I have a little bit of money? I'd like to get something for Mom if they didn't have some of their own money. And I'd say, yeah, yeah. Uh, and just imagine, just imagine a child coming up to their father. Imagine coming up to their father and say, Dad, Dad, I want to buy a Mother's Day gift. Can I borrow a little money? And, and Dad says, you know, that is just so awesome. You are so thoughtful. He says, thanks, Dad. Uh, just leave that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and I'm going to go buy, some, uh, 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 buy a gift uh, for Mrs. Jones. And the dad says, wait, wait, wait a second. It's Mother's Day. He goes, yeah. Well, you know, I've been spending a lot of time over at Eddie's house. And yeah, I know Eddie and I know Mrs. Jones. And I've decided I like Mrs. Jones better than Mom. So I'm going to buy my mom's present and give it to her this morning. Now, (laughs) that probably will never happen in your household. And can you imagine the reaction of the father? I'm not giving you money to buy a mother's present for someone else's mom. I mean, that might be a nice thing as long as you bought one for your other mother, but you're... This lady over here is the lady who birthed you. She's the one who's changed your diapers. She's the one that stayed up late at night. She's the one that has helped you with your homework. This is the one who would literally put her life on the line, throw herself in front of a train to save you. She would lay down her life and die for you. Why are you going to take what I want to give you and give it to someone else? It's, no, it's not anything bad with Mrs. Jones necessarily, but listen, this is who loves you, this is who created you, and this is who would literally die for you. And we do the same thing sometimes when we come to God in prayer. We say, Father, would you give me that good job? Would you help provide all of my needs? And he can see right through the mask, and he sees that we're wanting to give it to somebody else. Most of the time, we're wanting to give it to our pleasures, our own passions, our own desires, our own reputation. God says, listen, that is offensive. I am the one who created you, breathed life into you, 
More importantly, I'm the one who actually wouldn't just lay his life down for you, but I actually did lay my life down for you. And more importantly, I love you even more than your earthly mother loves you. There's an interesting verse that follows this, and it's, it's kind of challenging. In verse 5, let's, look what it says. Do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Now, there's some argument over this that the Holy Spirit or just the Spirit of life that is in you. I go with the second interpretation. And I, I see it sort of like that. Why would your dad and your mom want to fulfill your inordinate passions to give something to others? Because they have in themselves, it would create a jealousy of, of love. It's, it's, it's they love you and they want what's best for you. And, and I think our Heavenly Father created us, put a new spirit he, he, we were born again into the family of God. And just imagine how he feels when we take uh, uh, this new spirit, his, his new child, and we adulterate it with earthly and ordinate pleasures with, with others, the, the friendship with the world, the world system, which is driven uh, by satanic deception. If we give in to the old fleshly nature and Jesus died to give us a new nature. So he's, in a very godly way, in a loving way, he's jealous for that relationship with us. Can you see the blindness? This is what J James is saying. Can you see the blindness and the lack of true faith of those who in a continual way would just seek their own pleasure, their own way, their own selfish desires over the God who created them, over the God who laid down his life, over the God who truly loves. Living faith is a humble faith. And that kind of spiritual humility recognizes the true cause. It's our inordinate passions and desires that cause the conflicts. Second of all, it just regrets and repents of the cost. It sees that it messes primarily and ultimately with our relationship with God. And when we understand those two things, we are going to be looking and needing and humbly asking for the cure. And verse 6 is just a beautiful verse. Look at what it says. He, God, gives more grace. More grace. He gives us grace to not let those passions dominate us. Grace to see our sin and ask forgiveness from others in the church, from, from, from others in our family. Maybe even grace to go to your mother today and, and, just, and just ask for her forgiveness and, and heal that broken relationship. I, but God gives grace to help us see our sin. He gives grace to cover and forgive our sins. And he gives grace to set us on a path of spiritual humility that puts us in the right way to have harmony in our homes, harmony in our hearts, harmony in our churches. And so there's a program indicated by about 10 imperatives in the next few verses. And let me give them to you really quickly. Those who are humbly spiritually, once we've come to that level of brokenness, we're going to want what God wants. We're going to try to discover what the Lord wants. We're going to try to follow that and not get um, uh, driven off of, of course. Um, look at verse 7. We see that we, uh, the spiritually humble relinquish control. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. That is putting yourself in right order. Right order in your relationship between husband and wife. Right order in relationship between children and their parents. Right order, most importantly, between uh, the, the child of God and God himself. We submit ourselves and surrender our right to run our own life. Verse, uh, it continues, we will not only relinquish control, we'll resist the devil. We don't want him 
pulling us off course and into our uh, inordinate desires. We, we put on the whole armor of God. We saturate ourselves with God's word and we pray. Look at the third thing, verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Spiritually humble worship daily. They seek the presence of God. They seek to draw near. And God always draws near because you know why we can draw near to God? Hebrews says we have a spiritual high priest in Christ Jesus who has covered the way with his blood, his sacrifice, opened up the way. You and I can come into the presence of a father. No longer do we have enmity. No longer do we face his wrath. And as we draw near in Christ, he draws near to us. And this is just a daily worshiping experience. And when we draw near, you know what's going to happen? We're going to see our impurity We're going to see our inordinate passions, and we're going to want to do some things. Look at what he says in the last part of of verse 8. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. We're going to cleanse our hands, meaning we're going to change our actions. The humble of heart will also, they'll they'll want to not be double-minded. They'll want to purify their hearts. A fifth thing that you will do, spiritually humble When they look at their sin, verse 9, when they look at their sin and how their selfishness and their passions, it says, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Can I just tell you, somebody with the right spiritual humility doesn't look at the sin in their lives and just say, "Ah, I'm only human. They don't say that. The spiritual humble, they don't look at it and say, well, I'm, the devil made me do it. They just laugh it off. They giggle it off. Or in some way, they're proud of the things that their, their flesh drove them to do. They're not going to look at you and say, I just live a little. Come on, don't be serious. They're going to mourn over the brokenness between themselves and God's plan. Number six. Verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. You know what that says to me? The idea of humbling ourselves before the Lord and allowing him to exalt us is is trusting God's plan. My pride and my selfish ambition, my selfish desires are going to drive me to formulate my own plans, to execute my own plans, to try to get what I want and become what I want. And listen, Spiritual humility humbles themselves before the Lord and says, I'm going to trust your plan to put me where you need me to be, to exalt me in your plan. They trust God's plan. And then there's two more verses I want to point out because we'd be remiss if we didn't. Look at verse 11 and 12. And it was brought up a couple of weeks um, as Jordan was preaching. He said in verse 11, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. He says, we must guard our tongues. We must guard our tongues. The spiritually humble do not have to retaliate, and they would never slander a brother. Scripture is so clear in Ephesians. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. These seven steps, I believe, are just the continual daily pursuit of someone who has seen the cause of conflict. It's my passion, my selfishness. Sure, there's inordinate selfishness and passions in others and sinfulness in others. And, but ultimately, I've got to look in my own heart. Second of all, the spiritually humble are going to see the ultimate cost of our passions more than the, the disharmony it creates in our homes, the disharmony it creates in our communities. creates, makes God our enemy. It puts us at enmity with the Father. It puts us out of that sweet fellowship. And then we'll we'll want something different. 
And James lays out an incredible list of things to do to live that kind of different, peace-filled life. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. There's a story in the, in the Gospels that almost everybody's heard of. You may know some of the details. We call it the story of the prodigal son. As I was walking through this passage and thinking about it, that story so beautifully combines all of these images. The images of a home that's hurting, a home that's broken. It's broken by the inordinate passions and desires, the selfishness of the younger son who wants to live life to its fullest while he's young. He doesn't want to wait for his dad to die. He demands control. He demands his inheritance. He lets his flesh and his passions break the home apart and drive him out into the world. And Jesus makes clear in this this story that he's telling where the friendship with the world left that young man. But by the very grace of God, there was a a moment, eventually, where that young man saw what the world system and his passions led him to. And he found himself just living among the pigs, eating the pods that were thrown out to feed the pigs. He said, this is, this is not who I am. And what, what's incredible about that story is that a, that young man... Uh, was broken to the point of a spiritual humility where he saw the cause of his problems. He saw um, the cost of it. And he did what you and I need to do. If you're an unbeliever, you need to do this today. You can't wait. If you are in a bad relationship at home or maybe uh, with others in the fellowship, you need to do this today. He, He got up, it says, and he made his way home. With all humility. But watch God in this story. Not only is there a humble son returning, there's a humble God waiting. As the son drew near to the father, we see the father looking off in a distance, waiting. And when he saw the son drawing near, he drew near to him and he runs and he embraces this prodigal son. And he brings him in and he... He throws a feast that was totally undeserved. Uh, He gave him uh, uh, back his rights as a son when the son never expected such. And what an incredible picture of what God will do if you will turn and return. If you'll run to him, you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. She's never mentioned in the gospel. But I am just kind of visualizing that there's a mom in this story. And I know there's an older brother. But can, can you imagine how exciting it was for that mom to see the son return to the father? Can you imagine how brokenhearted she was when the older son, who had stayed at home, who'd mowed the lawn, grown the crops, taken care of the house, when he reveals through his hostility and conflict and his anger with the younger son coming home, he realizes and reveals that his heart all along was driven by personal selfish passions as well. He just stayed at home. And what that mother and that father wanted most is for both sons to be reconciled with the Heavenly Father. And some of you need to do that today. And as you draw near to God, He'll draw near to you. Would you look inside and just ask yourself this question, these final questions as we close. Whose desires are driving and guiding your life? Ask God to show you that. Ask God to show you that. Maybe it's at the core of the hostility in your home today. 
Second of all, repent. When you see that selfishness and that pride and uh, uh, turn and from that affection from the world, turn to the Father who created you. And to do that, you're going to have to humble yourself before the Lord. To bring harmony in the home, you may have to humble yourself and move back towards one another in repentance before the Lord and asking forgiveness of one another. Let me just, re- just remind you what verse 6 says, and this is his promise. But God gives more grace. You just have to ask. You just have to come to him. What a, what, a, what a rejoicing day that will be in heaven as you come to the Father for salvation today if you're an unbeliever. It says all heaven will rejoice. The angels will rejoice when you get up and you come to the Father who created you and loved you. What, it, will, it will cause our heavenly Father to rejoice if he sees your the conflicts in the church subside as you, you join together in a common mission and you set aside personal agendas and you move together forgiving one another full of mercy. And what a joy it will be, even maybe today in your homes as you come together and love one another. Would you pray with me? Father, I just ask for those that are watching, for those that are listening, you would grant to us a spirit of humility. Give us eyes to see the cause. Give us hearts that regret and repent of the cost, the way it uh, breaks our relationship with you and others. And God, help us run and pursue and, and stay on that path, that path of humility and repentance and obedience and seeking your will. And God, I pray you'll bring harmony, greater harmony, In every church, in every heart, and in every home. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we go today, let me just encourage you. If you feel like you are distant from the Lord and you'd like to talk to one of us, uh, I encourage you to reach out. There is a number on your screen that you can text us on. We'll respond to that. There is a link to a website, Westside Baptist dot org slash prayer take time today this will help you if you will uh, make this commitment in some form or fashion reach out let us know if you have prayed to trust Christ today if you need prayer for your home for the relationships that you have if there in any way if there's any way we can help you would you reach out to us today moms I'm so grateful for you thank you for watching today uh, from where you are Have a wonderful day. God bless you. Hey, thanks for joining us again online today. Listen, if if you want to take a next step in any way, shape, or form, feel free to text that number at the bottom, 321-754-0911, and let us know how we can serve you, how we can pray for you, uh, maybe how you want to respond to what Pastor David shared today. But we're thankful for you, and we're excited, and we'll see you next week.